scrolling in the wrong direction. <laughs> Not in the huh? This is not a professional presentation, but can you see my next slide? So you will not run out of power? So you will not run out of power. No. Okay, good afternoon. We have been waiting a little bit for people to find this room. This is a little bit of a navigation exercise. I'm, I'm sure by Friday we will all know where these rooms are, but people are still trying to find it at the moment. So this is the Thing to Thing Research Group. I'm Carsten Bormann. This is Ari Karinen. And uh, we are operating under the IRTF uh, guidelines for, for what they call intellectual property rights. Um, and these happen to be the same ones we use in the IETF. And, um, oh, I didn't include the NodeRail slide, sorry. Um, so you can find the, the, the information on this uh, link. And the most important thing to keep in mind is that um, if you're talking about some technology and you know about patent claims to applying to that technology, um, you uh, have a choice. You can tell us that there is a patent claim on the technology, or you can choose not to talk about the technology. 
Good. <clears throat> I think we do. We have all the things trivia, Java scripts. Who can serve as a JavaScript for this meeting? JavaScript doesn't mean you have to type everything the presenter says. It just means you you answer to questions from the uh, Java side and present them to the microphone. Preferably someone who does not themselves speak. So I'm sure Hannes can do that. <laughs> Thank you, Hannes. <laughs> Okay, and um, apart from the usual things that, that come with the working group or research group, um, there is also a GitHub uh, repository under the GitHub organization T2TRG. Um, and we, we create a repository for each uh, meeting. And that's uh, where uh, the, the most recent slides are and where uh, all other information is going to. Okay, yeah, that, that's exactly my problem. Um, Apple somehow broke Java in, in uh, the messages application, so I cannot. Uh, okay. So anybody else who can do the Java? Dirk, you certainly have Java on your laptop. Uh, no, for sure not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could install it now, and Huawei would be uh, uninstalling it in five minutes again. And Yeah, but yeah. other consequences, I'm sorry. <laughs> So there must be someone who still has Java, Java in this room. Francesca tries to look aside. <laughs> Can you do it? Okay, Francesca will try. I mean, there's, that's a best effort service, so. Okay, thank you. Um, so the um, agenda today uh, has a number of uh, reports from our own activities and from, from other organizations like OT Schema Org and, and W3C, whatever things. And uh, then we want to talk about one uh, particular aspect, which is the, the subject of um, hypermedia in IoT for half an hour. And then we will talk about uh, Friday's work meeting. There will be a meeting on Friday uh, uh, here in this uh, building. Uh, for thing to thing research group, and um, then we will uh, do our wrap up. So, just to remind people what <coughs> thing to thing research group is about, we have all these uh, uh, IoT standards uh, being created by the IETF, and uh, that's great. These are nice blocks, Lego blocks of interoperability. Uh, but what is the big picture? How can we, we turn a, tr tr a true Internet of Things um, into reality, an Internet where low resource nodes can participate and uh, can communicate among themselves and with the wider uh, Internet? That's the subject of this uh, research group. And of course, the focus here is on issues that have opportunities for standardization in the IETF. So we start at the irritation layer. We occasionally look a little bit at the radio layer, but not much, and we end with the user, the user experience, the application layer, and of course, security. So when you look at uh, the IRTF and the IETF, um, sometimes the question comes up, how, how do we actually uh, juggle the, the various pieces of work? And, um, this picture only shows uh, two IETF working groups at the moment. Of course, there are other IETF working groups that are doing IoT-related uh, things, uh, but uh, putting the whole picture on a slide would probably not work. And uh, basically, the, the idea is that the research group is on the side of open research issues that have uh, IETF potential, but are not yet ready for uh, carrying into the IETF. And the working groups are actually doing engineering, for instance, the core working group is doing the protocol engineering for restful environments in the IoT and uh, other groups um, or also the core group also do informational guidance uh, document and the LWIG working group, for instance, is uh, focusing on guidance for implementers in the IoT space because people in the IoT space um, usually are new to internet technologies and, and to 
uh, things like REST, and it helps to write up some things. So this is the, the, the idea about the division of work here, and we will pick up this slide again uh, in a couple of minutes when we talk about the hypermedia work. Um, so what, what did we recently do? There hasn't been much time be between the last report and now, so let me just say two things. Uh, we will talk about the Wishy work in a couple of minutes. Uh, so this is about uh, semantic interoperability. And um, we also uh, have been interacting with other uh, standards organizations, with customers of the IETF, um, giving some information that is useful for them <coughs> in deciding how to use uh, IETF technology. And uh, in, in the period since uh, Montreal, we have uh, uh, been talking to OCF, but other SDOs are also on the list, and uh, in particular W3C and ONA and so on um, are of interest in this uh, space. Um, when will we meet next? Uh, we have a work meeting this Friday, so from 8.30 on Friday uh, to uh, 1.20. Uh, and we will have some breakouts in this uh, meeting, including one breakout where we have an opportunity to, to go to another side meeting, the COIN side me meeting about uh, computing in the network that has some IoT aspects to it. Um, so this is the next physical work meeting. We also have pretty regular calls for the uh, WISHI activity. Um, so approximately monthly, um, we uh, try to coordinate in, in the WISHI activity. Uh, we have uh, uh, calls with OCF. Uh, we hope finally being able to set up a call with uh, OMA Specworks, the guardians of lightweight M2M and the IPSO objects. And uh, we certainly will have some activities at the Prague um, ITF meeting. So we, we probably will continue the Rishi uh, hackathon and um, <clears throat> might have other activities um, like maybe another work meeting on Friday. So we haven't really um, done a lot of planning about uh, 2019, but again, uh, collocating with academic conferences uh, might be done once or twice in 2019. So that, that, will, uh, that discussion will go on the list. Um, we have two uh, documents that we have agreed are research group documents. <clears throat> One is the state of the art and challenges for the IoT security document that is still ready. There has been a, a snag in, in the ISG processing that is required um, to get a document uh, published as an RFC. The ISG looks at research group documents and decides whether this is actually an attempt to, to work around some IETF cons consensus. And <clears throat> so they have to look at the document and, and uh, well, the ISG is very busy and, and that process didn't move forward yet. Um, the other one is RESTful design for IoT. So this is nearing completion. Um, that will be on the next slides. And uh, then we probably want to look at two areas. Uh, one is the, the hypermedia area where we have a, a nice submission, the core apps uh, document that I think has now its eighth version. And the, the coral specification, we'll talk about that in a moment. And there is also a, a draft about internetwork coexistence in IoT that got a lot of attention in, in some of the previous um, meetings. And uh, that's certainly something we, we don't want to lose, but where not much activity has happened in the last uh, few months. Okay, so we want to. Okay, so next, a quick update on the RESTful design for IoT trap. So we submitted a new version uh, right before the IDF deadline. Uh, the key things that have been added there is these considerations for patch and batch methods. 
those methods that we did standardize uh, for co-op quite recently. It also has uh, considerations around caching, for example, why caching is useful in IoT even if you have one-to-one -one communications that you are able to, for example, shield uh, a constraint device from frequent requests by, by doing caching. So iterating the benefits that you get with the RESTful, RESTful, RESTful architecture for that kind of situations. One thing we were contemplating quite some time is this, um, what should we do with the core apps draft? We uh, previously considered integrating that as a part of the RESTful design draft. However, after having a look, closer look at it, it's, it, the documents on its own is, is quite extensive and it has a lot of good information that it wouldn't really do a, a service for that draft to be part of another draft. It's better to have that as a standalone draft and then we could be referring to uh, that draft from, from this document. So that's the background on the uh, potential call for adoption on the uh, core apps draft. And I will have more details on that draft shortly. Also, we added a bunch of other IoT related details to the document that were uh, discussed in, in the Montreal meeting. But they were still, at the Montreal meetings, they were still only part of a, a PR, but now they're actually part of the uh, document in the data tracker. Next steps for the draft. Uh, I think it's actually, it could be published already as it is such. Uh, it's a lot of useful information there. But we did discuss with the co authors that maybe having some experiences uh, from building IoT systems using these RESTful technologies and in part on RESTful plus technologies, for example, the observe extension we have added in the core environment, getting some experiences from using these technologies uh, for building the web systems, for example, on Web of Things, on OMA, on OCF, and also on IoT platforms that many of the companies and, and other players in this space are building. So if you have any good insights on that or would be interested in discussing on that, please do approach us as co-authors. We'll be very interested to have a chat with you on your experiences on data, what we could actually distill then into this document. Like why, why is it good to be using RESTful technologies? What are the kind of, kind of things you have to be aware of? And what makes sense? Also, as usual, more reviews are very welcome. So please go ahead and read the document. Then we're also considering getting a more outside of, of IETF and IRTF reviews, for example, from the, from the microservices community. And hopefully, all things go well, this could be ready for a publication request around next summer, IETF 105. Anyway, I really encourage you to have a, have a read on it. Please send your review comments to the list or, or straight to the authors if it's only, only needs. Then a short report from the WISHI activity. So what we have had since the last IETF was uh, four online meetings. Uh, we have been discussing a variety of different topics. For example, IoT schema or definitions, how those can be used for, for semantic annotations. We have been discussing this topic of how we can add semantics to existing pieces of information. And their one topic was the semantic style sheets how we can use style sheet kind of an approach for getting exit piece of data and telling here are the semantics that are part of that data and how that can be, could be used to achieve a semantic interoperability. One specific example uh, on, on translation was uh, this declarative data conversion for JSON. How can you get arbitrary, uh, well, almost arbitrary JSON structures and convert them into something that has well-defined semantics, has standard structure, and how we can do that easily and, and efficiently. Also, one of the topics was this lightweight M2M integration using the Web of Things technologies and IoT schema or semantics. That's a, a similar topic that we've been already working on in the past hackathon and also on this hackathon. And also, in general, how the IoT schema org uh, can be used together with IPSO and lightweight M2M and also OCF models. How can we be bridging the, from these different ecosystems using shared vocabulary, using shared ontologies? And finally, we are planning to start this um, node series, if you wish, and, and one of those nodes that we already started on is this uh, semantics and engineering principles. So the idea is that we are gathering uh, some of those thoughts a bit more structured way to the wiki in the beginning, and then we'll, from the base on the wiki, we'll see if some of that information should be made into an, an internet draft. But this is maybe the one that is currently the furthest away on talking about, okay, why are we doing this work on the semantics? What are the principles that we are following? What are the principles we should be following? So that we all can agree on what, what, is the, what does the space look like? 
So that was the wishy activities between the IETFs, and then we had a session in the hackathon on Saturday and Sunday. So this was the fourth time we have WISI was participating in the IETF hackathons. We had eight participants, of, uh, two of them remotely. And as an overarching team in the hackathon, we had this connecting things from different ecosystems and how can you use shared semantics and hypermedia to achieve that. Uh, one of the things that we are playing around quite heavily is the lamp that you can see here uh, on the slide. So what did we do? Well, our key achievements, we did manage to turn that lamp on quite a few times and also off using, using programmatic methods and being able to control the lamp from device coming from very different ecosystems. So for example, what we had is semantic interoperability for data and actions between Lightweight MTM clients, uh, the Philips ULI that you saw in the picture, and then for example, a Comi toaster. So using these uh, management interfaces uh, based on Co-op, we had some challenges with the Comi toaster, it was using Seabor and the rest of the infrastructure was using JSON, but still, at least on the interaction level, we were able to do, do commands like read read temperature, set light, and not, not having to worry about the underlying protocol details, not having to worry about whether it's HTTP or co-op or MQTT underneath. Also, one thing we did was this new thing directory implementation called tiny thing directory. The thing directory is this um, entity in the network where you can store your thing descriptions, the web of things thing, the thing descriptions. And the existing implementation had some um, issues on, on stability and such. So, of course, then you implement a new one. And one learning that we saw on that one, actually, it was pretty easy. Given the kind of uh, infrastructure we have, we have co-op, we have, we have nice frameworks, setting up a thing directory was pretty straightforward in the end. Also, we were working on some of the related implementations, in particular, co-op research directory, in improving the implementations that we have. And then being a research group, it was not only a new code, but we also had a bunch of breakouts uh, during the weekend. So we had very good discussions, for example, on this adding semantics to binary data, uh, in particular looking at the Modbus way of representing data and having discussions how those could be addressed, how, the, how we could add, apply semantics there, how we can then bring that kind of information as a part of the bigger web-based web ecosystem. Also, we discussed hypermedia safety for IoT. So how can you tell some hypermedia action is safe? And not in the HTTP sense, but safe as in human sense. For example, if you're, uh, you have a form that is able to open a window, it makes a big difference if it's a living room window or an airplane window that is 10,000 feet high. So how can we have that kind of information presented as part of the hypermedia that even a machine could be making a conscious choice based on some of the safety aspects? And also we discussed the semantics and, and engineering principles that I mentioned about er earlier. And in particular, one thing around that area was this semantic uncertainty. So we classically ex uh, assume that semantics are pretty clear cut. All of the different endpoints agree what are the semantics of certain action. But in real life and in, in real systems, that can be pretty hard. So we may need to be able to deal with cases where we don't have quite 100% certainty what are the semantics of the other endpoint and how do we deal with that kind of situation. And also, one interesting observation we did is this usable semantics. So just like with IoT security, if the security is not usable, it's useless. So also semantics need to be usable for developers to start using it. So how can we lower the bar of starting to use semantic annotations, shared semantics, vocal vocabularies, ontology? How we can we make it easy for developers to actually we get that kind of instances out there and then be able to do the interoperability on a programmatic level? So, few quick learnings that what we learned there. Well, the semantic stuff actually is harder than you think. I mean, we've been doing this for <laughs> for a while now, but still we sometimes struggle. So, yes, having more usability for the semantics is, is very useful. And we have a bit different views on the on the area. So that's why one thing why we are now trying to document our views that we have better shared understanding. What do we mean actually with all of this? So it's almost meta semantics of our own work. And when it comes to hackathons and block fest and such, yes, setting up and testing stuff even before the event helps a lot. We did a bit of that already this time. We had stuff running online, etc. But even, even more of that is needed for, for the future hackathons. And we did discover a bunch of potential research topics for the team doing RG, something we could, could be looking closer. And if any of you are interested on any of these topics, please uh, go ahead and, and join the discussions. 
Okay, so that was report from Restful Design and Wishy. Michael, are you out there? Can you press the button? Okay, yeah. no questions on the previous topic. I think I pressed the button. I'm can not seeing that yet. Oh, yeah, you pressed that button. Okay, so uh, your slides are up. <laughs> <laughs> so, do we have questions? We have one more question to the previous one, Michael. Yeah, uh, but not a microphone. Not here. Like a microphone. Um, Michael, can, can you hold a sec? Uh, we have one question on the previous topic. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's a more uh, reflection. Um, when you were talking about the semantic, uh, a similar uh, use case you would have seen in the OMRDM mailing list. Uh, on the from David on this topic, probably it is good to interact and then see what we are going to solve in 1.2 and it is coexisting with the semantic solution. Yeah, that's a good point. We should have a closer look at that together. Let's let's put that on the agenda. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, Michael, the, the question is answered. So, uh, can you go ahead? Okay, is that I'm doing the right thing? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Good. Um, so go ahead and advance the slide. This is a, uh, I have a lot of slides, but I, I, it's more of an overview. So there, there are a lot of examples. Um, right. Okay. So I want to talk about um, sort of what we're currently doing with uh, IOTschema.org. And then some examples of the work we're doing, and then um, hopefully I, I can sort of wind up with a sort of a, um, elevator pitch, sort of what the message is that we're using going forward. So next slide, please. We had uh, participated in a workshop. Um, can you? Yeah. <laughs> We participated in a workshop that was held in conjunction with the uh, Semantic Web Conference. That was an SSN workshop. Um, I, I have summarized the presentation at the end. And it's also, I think, in our teleconferences folder of IOTschema.org. And the, really what we learned was that, um, that the terms we're using for action event and property are, are overloaded that they all already have other meanings, but when we took care to explain what we meant um, as in terms of these being uh, types of affordances on connected things, then uh, they understood that, but we need to sort of resolve the, the terminology issue, which is a good thing. Uh, people wanted to know mainly when, when things are gonna be available to use and um, how, how they're going to create and use definitions and what tools are available for that. Also, there was a, quite a bit of interest in using the definitions with existing ecosystems, as uh, Ari mentioned in some, his uh, talk previously. Okay, next slide, please. Um, great. great. So, um, other people presenting had uh, some automotive and building management and, and uh, uh, home care, aging in place sort of use cases. And um, they're really all, all, a lot of them mentioned Web of Things and a lot of mentioned some similar concepts about what we're, um, what we're focusing on and what we're missing in terms of feature of interest as well as some, some of the other gaps like uh, the observable property taxonomies like, you know, air, uh, temperature, uh, you know, water pressure, things like that, that, that we want to be able to express. But the sensor actuator vocabulary is really what we're working on with IOTschema.org. And then there's a, a sort of a need to express processes and procedures, which I would say um, commonly called also rules and behaviors and scenes and things like that. So we there's quite a bit of agreement on what we need to focus on going forward. Next slide, please. Yes. Well, that was the SSN workshop. Um, OK. 
kind of taking a while. I'm looking at the slide organization right now. So when I say yes, I have ad advanced the slide. Okay, I, I, I don't know all things, so um, let, me, let me try to get ahead of it a little bit. Okay, so where we are in terms of organization, we have a charter for the UPC community group, which is, uh, since we don't really have uh, our own um, way of, of having a legal policy, we're going to be uh, CEMA.org uh, and the W3C um, community group will we created a model an explainer and some introductory material, and we're working on integration with schema.org. Um, the idea is we want to try to have there not be a difference between the IoT part of schema.org and the other part in terms of you know having to have a subdomain. But we also need things to uh, unify the way we, we do the definitions, and there are some things there with using RDF shape that you wouldn't really want to do on, but it's also a, a kind of a big uh, change and a big learning curve. So we're working on that with Dan and, and, and other folks uh, to try to figure out how to bring. We have some prototypes for how that can work. So I think it's just a matter of maybe creating, uh, you know, just figuring out how to do the transition. Uh, so next slide, please. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. For developer tools, we're looking at basically um, what people use to create definitions and then what people use, uh, how people use definitions in deployed systems. And this is where we overlap a lot with the wishy work and the plug fests. And, uh, you know, there's some examples here of where we want to integrate. I don't have to read through them, but um, they're all basically having to do with. Uh, recognizing that, that the existing definitions really fall into two categories. One of, of device ecosystems like OCF and ONA, and other is more along the lines of features of interest, such as the Geneva VSS that describes parts of an automobile, or, and Haystack and Brick ontology that describe uh, HVAC systems and connected buildings and things like that, and a bunch of other APIs that are Know, dedicated product APIs like Alexa that, that are interesting to, to annotate also. And so we're working on all of these. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. All right, quick, uh, quick uh, example here. Basically, what we do is we want to get the existing definitions machine readable. We want to annotate those definitions and then use those annotations. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, in this format, to sort of generate thing descriptions or whatever we have as the runtime uh, instance con hypermedia controls for instances of things. And this is roughly the, the process, and I think it matches up with what uh, what Ari is working on and some of the other folks like uh, uh, Mike McCool on uh, OZF augmentation. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So as an example, we... We basically annotate JSON. We, we can plug JSON uh, LD or, or RDF statements into a JSON schema using JSON LD. And this is how, and this is basically the technique that we're using to, uh, to annotate the schemas and, and, and generate these pieces of, of hyperlink. It's kind of crude and blocky, but it's working well. Right, next slide, please. Yes. So some of the other stuff we're working on is API automation, and I think I already talked about that. The, the idea is that um, the, the, a software application should be able to use our abstractions, which are the, the interactions like read and write property, invoke action, subscribe and unsubscribe from events. Um, that could be the API. It could be a programmatic abstract API. Also, there's some idea about building templates around code red. Um, so here's some examples. Next slide. Um, a semantic API, for example, could could sort of assign variables based on matching semantic capabilities. And the idea is when you when you get something in response uh, to a query, then it itself can also be queried. And so you can build this chain of uh, next slide a semantic API that whoops, semantic API that 
that basically says, get me a, a light that has binary switch capability and, you know, turn it and, and tell me what the switch is and then possibly just turn it on or, or actuate it. So the idea is using the semantic terms um, and maybe the node red is a better example. Next slide on slide 13 um, it shows how basically node, node red nodes can be uh, to built to um, to be like the pieces of what I just showed you. And they can be wired together on a on a sort of a drawing board as the node red metaphor, and that basically creates the, uh, the application. Uh, next slide, please. And then with node red, uh, we're being worked on this at Siemens by, uh, by Darko Anichik and and colleagues. Um, they're also building data type adapters and unit code adapters so that theoretically you could, well, theoretically we're, we're trying to reduce this to practice where um, you can build an application that takes different range range mappings and scale mappings and types and and units and sort of adapts those automatically through these uh, these adapters. And then the next slide, please. So the idea is you can build these things up with recipes, um, as recipes, and uh, and do your discovery um, at runtime, and just provide these as, as the rules and as the, you know, of course, then we need to semantically describe what these do and, and things like that so that you know, the machines can plug them in. But um, this is sort of working on the aspect of API automation. Right, next slide, please. So um, going forward with the organization, we're, we're setting up the community group so that people can contribute and we have a bunch of uh, con contributions ready to go from, you know, from uh, from our company and from some others that, that want to look at bringing in some existing models. And also this idea of uh, to create some test beds beyond our plug fest. And I think uh, the idea was brought up to work with IC on this thing. Industrial Internet Consortium, who already creates test beds. Okay, so um, next slide. The upcoming teleconferences that uh, for uh, IoTschema.org, we have uh, Dr. Amelie Girard coming to talk about uh, this great survey that they've done on um, all of the existing definitions for devices and, and definitions that are out there for both devices and features of interest. And, and so it's, it's a great sort of everything that's been done, the wave and Zigbee and, and you know, BACnet and everything in there. And so that'll be interesting. So uh, Bruce Norton is working on energy monitoring. He's going to come talk about some use cases. So. Um, and that's what we have going forward, um, IOTschema.org. And then um, let me just go through these slides. So the next slide, slide 18. I want to sort of kind of kind of relay what the message is. And then next slide, slide 19. Um, the message is that we're solving this problem of there being so many standards organizations. Um, next slide by acknowledging that uh, there are going to be a lot of diverse IoT device ecosystems and, and you know, everyone isn't just going to sort of choose one. That they're, they're going to be coming and going and, you know, they, they have a lifetime and, and, and that. Um, so basically, we want to basically build an adaptation layer, the next slide, uh, that creates a second narrow waste around semantic interoperability. We already have two networks. People use a lot of different data types, just all the stuff we just looked at. Uh, the difference, another added deal with all of those differences and web of things, and that's sort of really what we're working on uh, in the way that we build IT networks uh, around common protocols, we move these things around some common patterns, so that uh, in the middle to plug in many different um, applications. And on the slide, we're just about done here. What we're doing is creating these layers on top of what we already have to um, 
to accomplish this. And then, you know, different organizations really are working in the different layers. And that's an important thing because we're really not trying to replicate Zigbee where they get everything from the video on up to application layer, but we're really trying to partition things out so that they want you know, more choice and more uh, composability and more modularity. And the thing that we're focusing on specifically in, in our message about what we're doing, next slide 23, is that we're, we're basically providing a, a way to, um, to connect stuff that already exists in the semantic world as well. We're, we're not inventing new quantities or units. We're not inventing new features of interest, but we're putting our definition work around the software affordances so that, um, next slide, last slide. Michael, yeah. Michael uh, do you want to have questions now or in the end? We have one in the queue. I'm almost done. And I want to take questions after I, I really make this last point. Okay, thanks. What we're doing with IOTschema.org and the way we're solving this problem is that we're, we're basically enabling these software affordances that are on connected things like door locks and light brightness controls. And we're, we're enabling them to be connected to the real world. So we can say, you know, so lock the security doors. And we have enough semantic description to, uh, to make that part of the API. So we can say that in the API instead of having to worry about, you know, all of the protocols. So um, those last slides were, were basically our message uh, out to the, the community. And, and that's how we got the feedback that we got. Okay, so um, that said, I, now is a good time to take questions. And I think we're pretty much okay on schedule, right? Um, could you get, go back a few slides on this, on this one, the, the star slide? You, you don't see it here, but uh, not this one. The one that you just had, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so, Michael, you're saying you're not adding a new standard, um, which it's just an adaptation layer, you know? If I would put lightweight M2M in the middle of the box and would say um, every, every sort of, it maps that lightweight M2M is probably the wrong, the wrong comparison here because we would have to talk about the data model or the OCF data model and then map anything else to uh, this, the star, in, we had this uh, workshop and we create, uh, Dave Taylor created this nice star which we actually put in the workshop report. And in some sense, uh, well, Carsten's uh, slide, and essentially we have everyone saying that they are the big star uh, in the middle and the others just interconnect with them nicely, but they are not yet another new standard, they are just a new star. Um, and that, that sort of bothers me because it creates this unfortunate situation that we and like you had in your in the um, in the comic that we are of course adding a new standard um, to a new modeling language for describing things which unfortunately fragments the ecosystem and the ecosystem that is uh, focused on standardized based solutions I think there should be more collaboration among the companies working on the standards because then I think the compete or the the enemy is not the other standard. The enemy is the proprietary solution, in my opinion. I think we should reduce the friction in the standards community to have a more interoperable solution in the end rather than um, beating our, ourselves up. I know that this is very uh, great, like everyone likes to work on new stuff and create yet another new thing, but I've, I believe it's better if we actually use what we have and then um, go from there and try to make the best out of that. Call me weird, but I think the standards uh, ecosystem and IoT, many of the companies here who uh, are in this room have been working on, on their products for many years. And I don't know if there, there needs to be a, a point in time where we say, okay, this was now enough. Uh, now we have created so many things, so many different variants, and now we actually need to make use of them. Like there's a long list of different uh, data modeling standards that nobody ever uses and doesn't use today. They are just on paper. They sound nice and cool and do all sorts of great stuff, but they are not, um, 
it just didn't reach that level of maturity or, or didn't see that deployment. I think we have to reduce and consolidate rather than enhance and enhance and enhance. Hi, hi Michael Padu here. Hope you are doing fine. Um, the um, my general comment or question is um, now you are making one semantic interoperability definition uh, with your experience in all these hackathons, etc. Do you see the need for splitting it into two or three different types depending on what all has is coming through and going out of it? Uh, rather than making a one monolithic semantic interoperability definition. Yeah, I would agree with that. And and really, um, we're not really trying to do a monolithic definition. And I think <clears throat> maybe one of the things that didn't really, um, I didn't really talk about that much was that the idea is that people from different application <clears throat> domains can really bring their own definitions. What we're trying to first standardize on is just the, the serialization languages and the processing tools so that we can have a, a common set of uh, things there. And, and that also means a common set of semantic categories. So we want to talk about capabilities and interactions and data types. Um, and, and so in a, in a sense that, that we want to find some things that are common, so um, I, I guess to the last part of the answer to that is that we we have discovered that all of these different standards, like you look at Zigbee and lightweight M to M and all of that, you look at how a light bulb is controlled and they're really all doing the same thing. They're just providing different interfaces and different serializations of, of the information that's needed to do that. So change the brightness of a light bulb, turn it on, turn it off. What's the current temperature? Set the temperature of the thermostat. These these are all common. That nobody really does anything different. And so these are really the try the things that we hope to uh, normalize in terms of the semantics. And the other thing that we didn't really you know talk about at great length was that um, as Hannah said at the workshop we had these these stars and part of that was we were trying to decide between you know, the, the adaptation and normalization versus translation. And I think we have to enable all of those. So uh, to the extent that all these different standards already exist, uh, you know, um, this is a way of at least talking about them all in the same way. And, and, and eventually we can move to a smaller set of things. I think we will realize we don't need that many different permutations. So this is part of really trying to bring things together and, and really trying to add another layer instead of trying to build another standard to compete at the same layer. And so in the sense of, does another layer compete? Well, I don't know, did IP networks did compete with Token Ring and did compete with X25. So in, in that sense, we are competing, but um, you know we're not really trying to create another Token Ring or X25, we're trying to create another layer that that, that makes those things less relevant and less less of a big deal. Michael, if I may, this is Zach Shelby from ARM. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I'm gonna be a little bit controversial. So we're all internet engineers. We love to completely define our problem and be able to exactly control and speak and understand everything and all the semantic models about every piece, every bit, but Recently, I started working with data scientists. We have a team of data scientists at ARM and um, they're all millennials. They're a little crazy. You guys know millennials, right? We have some millennials in this room. And they, they're, they're math people and they work with Python and they, they look at data in a completely different way than we do. And I think I've started to see some warning bells go off for myself that I don't understand how the people who actually have to make sense of the data coming out of our things that produce information over the internet are going to make use of that. How they understand the data, what are the tools they need to interpret it and run machine learning algorithms on it, generate useful results. Because in the end, what matters in IoT is that a business or a consumer can generate value, right? 
from these systems. It does something useful. And that's going to involve a lot of big data and a lot of data scientists. So does it matter? What I'm starting to realize working with data scientists is they don't care about the exact semantics of your data. Dump it all in a big table and they will figure it out. They need some guidance. It would be useful to have some, some documents that explain what the semantics of this stuff is. Where did it come from? Is it trustable? Device attestation comes into play. But actually, they don't care about knowing every little bit of information about the semantics or the ontology doesn't matter. I think this is something we just want to keep in mind um, when we're working on this. Now, I get it for control, and a lot of this talking about control, that's good. But I think the, the big data collection and interpretation problem is just as important. Yeah, that's a good I think that uh, <clears throat> um, one of the things that has come out in the review of these semantic categories is that it's good to have the, the data plane and the control plane separated, which was feedback I got from your team, Zach, exactly, was that it was good for uh, people who are just working on data to be able to deal with the semantics of the data and say, yeah, this is temperature data, just to have some simple hints about the data, like you said. Not the whole ontology, but in terms of the definition, to, it's useful to have an IoT standard uh, was the feedback where they don't have to worry about the interaction model and can deal with just, just the data. So maybe there's some ways of, of sort of taking this use case into account and, and building out that part of it. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I think that's a good point, and maybe that's something to take into account in the work you're doing here, that kind of architecture, the difference between control plane and control and, and just data gathering. And, and as an example, um, I started throwing some of our models and tools we have at the IETF towards data scientists, and when I showed them CENML, they were mind blown. How can you have this much information about the data? You actually know the unit and a time, you know, th th this is like already a huge improvement from what they have today, which is people just dump lots of stuff into a JSON, random JSON format, and they have to like shift through it and figure it out. So we might want to, might not want to put the bar and the complexity level too high. People um, already start to value the simple stuff that we do. So control versus data plan, that might be a useful tool actually for the research here. Until the data scientists want to do analytics on the interactions as opposed to the data itself. Right, but then but then, then you, the interactions become data for the data scientists. Exactly. And then you probably need documents explaining the, the relevance of the different pieces of information, how they relate to each other. And that there an ontology might make sense. But that's probably more for a human who has to understand the, the relationships more than it having to be machine interpretable at runtime. So, yeah, I just think this is a new and this is a new thing we have to take into account when we're when we're doing work here is take into account the big data processing needs and what people are trying to achieve. I don't know the answer. I just, that's why this is re, a good thing for the research group to look at. Matthias Kovac Siemens. Um, so actually, I don't see any conflict between what Zach said and what what uh, Michael Costa is working on here. So the discussion is going on over there. Um, well, maybe for the rest of the people. So so the idea here is that you annotate small pieces of information with exactly that piece of information that would be useful for the data analysts. And it's not about designing kind of this complete world model of the old semantic web. But it, the idea is taken from schema.org, where search engines place like small annotations on websites that come from various different fields that are developed by different companies. But they, they in the end, have small pieces of the same kind of information. And they annotate it in the right way. And different search engines can understand this and can make sense of this. And this key idea is also uh, kind of uh, reflected in the IoT schema.org world. And I think a, a big part is that it's this, this closed world assumption. So we don't uh, describe everything and then have a complex ontology to really understand everything, but just to identify and know uh, this is what we agreed on, and then to consume it and, and calculate or do whatever 
we want in in kind of the with the controlled meaning what it actually was. Yeah, I, I would like to add to that. There are of course many different things you can do with IoT, and and one is data gathering, and in particular if the 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 things you actually do with the result of the data gathering are kind of inconsequential. So you, you care about the, the overall statistical likelihood uh, of, of your conclusions being right. But it's, it's not a disaster if any single one of the conclusions is, is uh, uh, wrong. So that, that's a very different um, area if, um, from the, the ones we, we discussed on, on Saturday, uh, where there might be actuations that actually have uh, significant uh, consequences and you have to make sure that those actu actuations are actually labeled in, in such a way that they are much harder to get wrong. So let, let, let me just give you a real world example. Um, I get lots of uh, uh, dates, appointments per email and half of the people send me ICS uh, messages and apart from the fact that, that most people don't understand time zones, these are usually very useful because they go right into my calendar and there is little confusion. And then, of course, my mail reader has a, uh, an artificial intelligence function for finding uh, dates out of plain text. And that's great because uh, about half of the, the messages in plain text I get that, that tell me I have to be somewhere at some time actually decode correctly. But if I were using the other half uh, unchanged as well, I would be in weird places uh, at weird times. So um, in, in that case, uh, the, the data quality is not very high and it requires human uh, intervention to actually make useful results from that. I'm still happy that they do this um, because some, some people don't know how to generate ICS messages and so on. But I think the, the direction uh, we want to move in is we want to make it easier for developers to actually uh, generate data that can be used for, for uh, processes, the outcomes of which have a high consequence. I'm not seeing anyone at the microphone line, so uh, thank you, Michael, for this update on IoT Schema Org. And uh, we will go on to an update of uh, W3C Web of Things. Oh, right. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, I'm um, part of the ITF, I'll participate here, but I'm also co-chairing a working group at the W3C, which is about Web of Things. Um, we have been around for almost two years now, and uh, yeah, I have some updates on what we did uh, recently. Um, for giving you the recap, what we are doing, it would be nice to have the slide. Yeah, move forward. You, you okay. Just go quickly. Okay. Should have your latest slides. Great. Yes. So um, a lot of this you already heard from from uh, Michael Costa just now. So uh, we really try not to establish like this new silo and tell everyone this is now how you have to implement all your things. We try to tackle that uh, problem that a lot of system integrators and users of IoT systems have, that there are so many established ecosystems, and as Hannes said, so it's hard to figure out which one is the star, which one to which system should I convert everything, because for each deployment it varies, um, but you still have to make sense at the end of the data, and you also have to figure out how do I control this, so what are the interactions that are around there. And uh, we try to, to uh, collect some um, yeah, pieces of technology from, from the World Wide Web that work there that help to, to have some convergence in, on these different applications that we have on the web and adapt them in such a way that they work for, for IoT. And uh, the working group uh, now has uh, the, the following deliverables. So there's a, do a document on the overall architecture, like how should these different pieces come together. The central one is the uh, thing description. So this is a representation format where you can collect all this metadata and annotations for existing systems. Uh, we have an informative uh, document on binding templates that basically just explains you how you can use the thing description to uh, describe a known ecosystem or a device of a known ecosystem. So for instance, this is how you would describe an OCF device. 
And uh, then we have an optional building block, a scripting API, because there was a big demand for kind of a common runtime. How do you develop IoT applications? So this is a, a scripting API that works on top of this uh, thing description abstraction model that we have. And the last one is a security and privacy guideline, um, which points actually to a lot of existing work because um, we at this top level where we just described, we cannot solve the, the intrinsic problem of uh, IoT security, but we point to a lot of uh, documents that actually already did a good job to, to educate people how you should build IoT systems. Um, to, to give a quick overview of this main deliverable, so this uh, thing description is a JSON-based format. Um, that's just because of the popularity for developers and also data scientists and so on. So it's basically made uh, out of three features. So one is that we can provide these semantic annotations uh, that we just heard from, from Michael. So it's about um, uh, controlled vocabulary and you can annotate specific parts um, yeah, with uh, words that a group of people agreed on. Um, this is where we collaborate, for instance, with the IoT schema org activity. Then overall, the document is built in such a way that you can parse it uh, with the JSON-LD tooling. So the JSON-LD is something that uh, lets you parse a JSON document and create triples out of it so that you can use the semantic web tooling, uh, which is, for instance, quite powerful if you want to have a complex queries that includes the semantics about something. So the Sparkle queries is something that is done um, quite often and one of the most powerful tools, I would say, with, with good tooling behind. Um, and there's also reasoning capabilities so that you can infer some new knowledge uh, if you have it in this uh, triple format. Um, however, we um, got a lot of feedback that there should also be an alternative path so that you can take a thing description, do the JSON-LD processing, but you can also do a just raw JSON processing uh, because if you know the terms that you agreed on and what your device expects, then you can just uh, yeah, uh, process it the traditional way and, and have a a compact parser, which then also, for instance, fits on embedded devices and so on. Uh, the second aspect is to uh, be able to describe the data um, model that is in the different devices. So for that, we adopted the JSON schema because it's a widely used um, standard for that. What we provide is basically a linked data version of that. So we take the, the central vocabulary and transfer it to a linked data vocabulary so that it can be plugged into the thing description. And uh, a nice part is that uh, these uh, data schemas are um, fully compatible, so you can take them from the thing description, feed them to a JSON schema validator, and those already existing implementations work for, for that purpose. And the last part is where we leverage hypermedia control, so work that is also done in the T2TRG, um, to describe uh, the interactions between things. So one aspect is that we have web linking that um, yeah, we can express the relation between one thing to other things like subcomponents of the thing or what is controlled by the thing, but also point to classic documents. So for instance, additional metadata for a thing, which can even be just a, a, a manual for the human reader um, that, that you can discover this way. The other half is this uh, hypermedia forms that were discussed a lot in this group. Um, it's kind of a more extensive way to describe how to construct a request that will be understood uh, by, by the origin server. And uh, with that, we can basically have the model of the thing. Um, we understand um, on the high level what is the semantics based on this kind of uh, controlled vocabularies. We can understand the data model used on the data schemas. And then we also know how to construct a request uh, for a specific protocol. Kind of the common denominator here is that you, there must be a URI scheme for the protocol that is being used. And the starting point is having HTTP co-op uh, in there. And uh, we are working on getting some MQTT URIs so that finally these topics become a bit more usable, let's say, that uh, you can also address them in this uh, web way that there is this yeah, uniform interface uh, for this yeah, not to be ignorable ecosystem in the IoT. The thing description provides um, a lot of extension points. I mean, it's kind of the, the first uh, piece that, that we are standardizing and uh, we need a lot more uh, experience from the field. For that, uh, we included a lot of extension points. One is that you can plug in your domain vocabularies, so it could start like bottom up, that uh, some existing ecosystem has some specific uh, semantic definitions that you uh, create a linked data vocabulary out of this and using the JSON-LD context mechanism, you can plug this in and then annotate with your understanding what your device is offering 
And then that's already a good starting point for others who want to understand that because they have some yeah, clear, unique uh, identifiers there, what, what is the meaning uh, of the individual pieces. And the other part is these what binding templates where um, we started already describing, okay, if you have an HTTP server somewhere that behaves in that and that way, um, this is how you would use a TD to describe that. Um, the reason here is often a lot of IoT devices, even if they use HTTP, they always have these small quirks where they do it slightly different from a vanilla HTTP. Um, same situation for co-op where, for instance, for OCF, you need some special options that are only used by OCF devices and no other co-op device basically would be uh, able to, to talk to that. All these kind of details we collect in these binding templates so that you can construct a TD that yeah, gives you all the details. Good, um, a quick update on the recent changes. So feature-wise, um, we um, revisited the event interaction pattern. And what we saw is that, for instance, for uh, webhooks, often you need some kind of input format. So you have to construct a message that you send there uh, where you can uh, often also define like filters or need to specify some details that uh, you can actually subscribe to an event. And uh, coming back to the webhooks, uh, often as uh, existing uh, services uh, need a special format for the cancellation message. And uh, yeah, those parts can now also be described next to the actual data that is then transmitted to you when, when an event occurs. Uh, the second part is something that has been kind of on the back burner. We knew it's uh, required your UI templates. Um, and yeah, we are finally kind of resolving this. Um, we had a lot of other things to do. That's why it's uh, this late. Uh, we had a few uh, alignments of the terminology that we're using. Uh, one was that we started with a term called writable to identify properties yeah, that you can write to. Um, we are now aligning with uh, the JSON schema term read only. Uh, one was that we got feedback from others that by default their properties are writable, so it's a good default to, to express it this way. Uh, something that we noticed is that the word writable is terrible because there is no E in the middle, but we found like a lot of instances of TDs where, where there is this typo, and that's really a cause of yeah issues that you have just because of uh, uh, the small letter there. Um, smaller things like uh, labels, now title, just as in uh, web linking. Um, we found some issue with uh, using just media type in the forms because often uh, you not only need the media type but also parameters that might be relevant for this. And because the form tells basically what the client has to construct and what metadata the client has to put in the message, you need kind of the full flexibility that you full instance uh, can include the, the char set uh, for text plane. Uh, media types, or for instance, for Cozy, you also need uh, parameters to define that. Um, JSON-LD, for instance, also new, uses that a lot to define the profiles, basically um, what um, context is applied to a certain uh, document. And the last point is, um, so originally we discussed here about forms and uh, kind of the natural term that, that Klaus used was uh, form relation types, because it's really related to the link relation types. Uh, we got, however, so much feedback that we kind of gave this up. Um, rel is kind of relations, links express relations to other resources. Uh, forms are more proactive, so um, we changed it to op for operation and hope that there is just yeah, less discussion around this, this wording. And uh, we added a few new, new terms. Uh, maybe the most interesting is this unit term, uh, where we also want to use this UCOM system that is uh, yeah, was already used by Lightbyte M2M, um, Ipso, uh, uh, Half Layer 7, and so on. Uh, it's pretty powerful. I also learned that there is uh, an implementation for Java, or maybe even included in an upcoming Java version, uh, where you can then automat do automatic uh, conversations between two different units that um, only have, for instance, a different weight, like milli and giga, and so on, and can resolve this, uh, which is pretty nice. There's, uh, I can also provide. Uh, a link, maybe I patch it in for the uploaded slides uh, to some recent work uh, that shows how uh, you can even do then uh, semantic queries that ignore kind of uh, what unit is your original data in. It can basically automatically convert to match whatever you write in the query. So for instance, give me all the things that are five meters away, and if it's in the express in kilometers or in inches, doesn't matter, this engine can, can uh, com uh, compensate for that. So uh, what's the roadmap? Uh, so we started around Christmas uh, 2016, so 
of course, we only started beginning of 2017 of, because of this break. And um, we had two groups running in parallel. The interest group uh, was mainly for the liaisons and outreach. So there we try to actually talk to most of the other standards organizations that are out there. Um, most of them try to solve the same issues. So this is where we, we try to cooperate and find uh, better convergence. And uh, we contact, uh, conduct so-called plug fests, uh, which is basically interop testing where uh, the, the participants already have implementations and we basically, yeah, running code as we use it in, in the ITF. And uh, the working group uh, yeah, focused on, on the deliverables. And then something that happened uh, about here is that uh, we got a lot of feedback that we need a nicer format for the thing description. And the JSON-LD 1.1 working group started their work. Um, they had something uh, pretty stable from a community work already. And we said we, we adopt this uh, because it's a way more um, idiomatic JSON format that you see. Uh, JSON-LD 1.0 is really quite ugly. Um, this adoption, this change and so on, however, uh, caused us uh, to, to require an extension. Um, I guess everyone in standardization knows that it always takes a bit longer. And the kind of tight schedule that we have now is that uh, in uh, January, end of January next year, we want to have a candidate recommendation. That means this is what the working group proposes and uh, basically has to freeze the document. And uh, then we have to go into testing phase. We have to show that there are at least two different implementations for each of the features that we uh, define in this uh, recommendation track document. And uh, then around uh, April, May, we want to have the so-called proposed recommendation. This is when uh, the, the candidate was successful, so that all the tests and so on um, provide enough evidence that it's implementable. Uh, then there's some uh, process where the AC representatives of the member companies can, can comment on that. And then basically end of the extension, we want to have the recommendation uh, out there and then look into rechartering. Uh, what exactly that will be is uh, quite open. Uh, for that, we plan to have another uh, W3C Web of Things workshop around May, uh, probably happening in Munich, um, to connect to kind of the community out there, to industry and so on, and see what the new requirements are. The last one is uh, was uh, four and a half years ago. Uh, it was quite successful. It was a broad audience, so we hope uh, to repeat that to really yeah, understand what should be the next uh, features we are working on. And uh, in parallel, um, as uh, Michael announced, there, there will be an IT schema or community group. It's a bit unclear if it will be the Web of Things community group or a specific IT schema or community group. And uh, another member uh, proposed the business group around smart cities, um, which is kind of a promising use case where this Web of Things technology can be employed because you have this requirement of describing different ecosystems and you also want to provide uh, open access to, to a lot of this data. Good, um, that brings us uh, to a couple of to-dos, uh, kind of the most worth mentioning is um, what we now have to do. So we adopted features from JSON-LD 1.1 and it really makes the document much, much better. Um, an issue is that um, they won't complete their work um, when we want to go to recommendation. So we cannot have a, a reference, a normative reference to that. And uh, in particular, because there's one feature that is not stable enough yet, um, however, quite important, it's basically if you have a resource structure with sub-resources, uh, usually this is converted by many standards into a JSON structure that then has um, yeah, a sub-object and then the sub-resources as uh, members in there. Um, at the moment, uh, they, they cannot provide um, the URIs that are used for linked data in that way that you basically construct a path like that you go a bit deeper uh, into the structure at the moment, uh, basically, if you have something that is called the same way, overrides the previous definition of that linked data node, and uh, that's really bad. Um, we talked to the JSON-LD working group, and they were quite positive about this feature, but it won't finish in time, so that's why we have to do the workaround that our recommendation will basically define an algorithm that can transform our, uh, well, the JSON-LD 1.1 features that are there and then do a JSON-LD 1.0 processing, and that way we have this kind of yeah, uh, normative document requirement fulfilled. And um, two features where, um, if you have an opinion on that, we would uh, welcome feedback a lot, um, because we have to wrap them up. One is uh, how to model meta interactions. So if you have a thing, and there is, for instance, a special resource where you can read out all the properties at once, or there's another resource that allows you to use patch to write multiple resources at the same time. 
what would be the best way to, to express this, to model this. There are uh, proposals there already, but uh, we couldn't reach conclusion, un unfortunately. And the other thing is, like, how far should this URI template abstraction go? Um, if you have opinions on that, please uh, yeah, contact me or go to our GitHub repositories. That's it. Any questions or comments, Matthias? Hello, uh, I'm Wang Shu from China. I have a little question. Uh, uh, last uh, slide. Last, last. Last? No, last. The very last slide, uh, this one. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, this. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> I make misty. Uh, ah, ah, ah. Oh, yes. Um, I want to know uh, how do you describe the thing, uh, the thing where have an identifier? How do you define the identifier of things? Okay, um, it's a bit small in here and it's not uh, meant for reading. Uh, basically, we define an ID um, yes. field and then you can put any IRI in there. Um, often it's URNs that are used, but you can also use uh, URLs there. Um, that basically gives you the unique identifier on the global unique level yeah. that is also used in, in the semantic web. Um, we have some other fields that we added uh, or are going to add is uh, model number, serial number, so some standardized term where the classic kind of definitions of yeah, hardware that is built uh, can fit in. But the main identity management goes around this uh, IRI identifier. URL, URL identifier. Yeah. Uh, but maybe URL can be changed if things move to somewhere. Okay. If I will be changed. Yeah, so um, that's where the Web of Things is different from the normal yeah. web. So on the normal web, you usually use really the URL where you oh. can really uh, dereference and get the representation of what, what you're talking about. Here in, in the uh, Web of Things, we often use URNs, so oh, names right. that cannot be uh, automatically would be resolved and for instance there is this draft on device urns uh, by Yari Arco uh, which is one of the best candidates to to do so uh, but how how do you reserve the urn so if different kinds of application your different urn how do you resolve this yeah, so it's only the identifier. It's not the locator where you can reach the thing, the, the, the way you can reach the thing. There is uh, basically these form fields and they have also href entries. So uh, yeah, URIs that then point to, for instance, the current uh, IP address. And uh, there's a mechanism that is pretty similar to the core resource directory that mobile devices, for instance, can refresh and update uh, registrations so that you can also uh, find uh, mobile devices. Um, kind of the exact way how you discover the thing descriptions is actually not defined yet. We only define this format and you can take away most of the, the solutions from the core working group that has, for instance, the resource directory, the multicast discovery and so on to, to do the actual discovery of thing descriptions. I think it's too hard or too difficult to uh, build a un uniform platform to resolve this list identifier uh, yeah so it's again it's not it's at the moment we, we don't plan to have like the, the global system and everything is connected there the problem that we are solving is that uh, for instance as Siemens uh, we do a lot of professional building automation and if you have a building like this or an airport or an hospital you have yeah. so many different systems yeah. that you all need to integrate especially now that for instance the energy domain is combined with the automation domain uh, you have uh, electric cars that somehow mingle up in there and so on, and you need some uh, consistent view over all these systems and, and be able to also then uh, do, for instance, di uh, diagnostic queries to figure out where something goes wrong. And for this integration step, this is a very good solution. And then we have to see just like the World Wide Web took uh, 20 years or longer to actually evolve to a uh, oh. facto application layer, there we have to figure out what is needed and how to get there. But at the moment, it's uh, for these integrators. Uh, for instance, uh, Michael Costa is working for Samsung SmartThings. They try to integrate a lot of these consumer platforms and how you can treat them in a, in a common way. And for all those, uh, Web of Things is uh, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, Matthias. Uh, we are slightly behind the schedule, but we have uh, next the discussing on the core applications and Coral. So I'm going to give a very brief um, intro on what, what is core applications and on how we are planning to handle it here in the research group. So you all know Core, the constraint restful environments, where we're using web technologies for the very constrained devices. And Core applications are simply applications that are built in that kind of environment. So this draft, uh, it's written by Klaus Hartke, is um, basically a convention and template for these kind of applications, that, especially the application designers, how they can build hyper media driven applications and interfaces in a structured way. So you can think of it as a guidance, guidance document on that. And the goal of this document is to have for inter implementers to build interoperable solutions for clients and servers, but also be able to reuse things uh, more simply and easily because you have a, a similar way of describing your applications. This draft defines uh, seven core um, API components uh, that you should be discussing when you do a, a design for your interface and application. Starting from communication protocols that are identified by URI schemes, so you're telling whether using HTTP, co-op, something else. But in particular, it's not defined in the URI um, full URLs. O only the schemes are the key part that are defined uh, here. The next thing is a representation formats, so internet media types you are using for exchanging representations. And then you have uh, relation types for links, but also for forms, and the forms that was also mentioned by Matthias uh, in his presentation on the Web of Things. Finally, you have um, templated links, so you may have links that you are um, putting information based on variables uh, during runtime, and you can have templates for that. And in a similar fashion, you can have uh, form field names. And finally, in some, it is an optional feature to have these well-known locations. So for example, if you need an API entry point uh, for how you are able to discover your application, how to interact at a well-known location can be very useful for this. But all in all, these are just uh, inbound instructions how the client can be um, interfacing with a given, given application. Taking this information, the client should be able to interact with the hypermedia controls that your application is providing. Then I mentioned that there is a template. So the template is pretty much a description, a human readable information about the API, uh, containing information about the seven components that were mentioned in the previous slide, and then some other useful information like application names, what are some considerations for interoperability and security, and who are the persons to contact to if you want to be do having some information about this application or perhaps want to be able to change here, who, has, who is in change control. And that's really what the whole draft defines, the structured way of describing your hypermedia driven applications that you will be using in an IoT environment. So this is the document we are now uh, referencing in the RESTful Design for IoT draft as a as guidance that if you are doing an application that's using hypermedia, it's a good idea to do it in this kind of way. So, and, and to have this uh, RESTful Design published also, we will have a, a reference to this document. So this document would also be very good to be published as a research group document as a result. So at this moment, of course, what I'd like to have is your reviews on this. Please have a look. Um, does it make sense? Does it address your concerns? If you're making this kind of application, is it all understandable? Have, have a read at the document and, and tell us what you think. Okay, any questions on core apps? Okay, that was quick. Okay, I promise to, to get back to this uh, picture here. And it actually shows core apps somewhere in the middle uh, because it really is, is about architecture. Um, and um, so it, it, it concerns implementers, it concerns the protocol engineering um, a bit, uh, but it's mostly actually about uh, how to use uh, the, the mechanisms we have. Um, so it, it's reasonable to work on this uh, in the research group. But uh, for, for the next couple of minutes, I want to talk about uh, one other thing um, that uh, we are looking at. Um, about two years ago, we started looking at something called Coral, um, which is the constrained RESTful application language. 
Um, and there's a little problem there because it's not a language. Um, but the, the abbreviation is nice anyway, so we call it Coral. Um, but the idea is that um, apart from, from describing metadata like, like a, a thing description does, you actually sometimes need ways to, to um, interchange instances that, that have useful information in them. And uh, we have various forms of these instances. And uh, one is actually the, the link format, which is also metadata, but it's, it's metadata that actually is bound to specific URIs pointing you to specific places where you can um, get data. Um, and the link format is, is um, uh, great for, for doing some basic description of uh, uh, places where you might, might find other resources that are related to the resource that, that you are looking at or to the device that you're looking uh, at. Uh, but uh, from that, you actually get to a place very quickly where you also want to include additional data uh, with that. And uh, yeah, we, we, we try to, a link format is, is, has been an RFC for six years now. Uh, we try, first tried to do just a JSON version of uh, the, the link format, uh, but um, that, that uh, ran into problems. The, the main problem was people found it useful and uh, said, hey, it has to have that feature and that feature and that feature. And uh, we, we ran into a bit of a problem with uh, the compatibility with uh, link format that we were trying to achieve. So we were moving away from that compatibility, uh, but maybe it's actually a good idea to, to look at this, this coral approach of representing the same kind of uh, data. And I want to spend some, some minutes uh, talking about that. So the coral has been presented at a number of interims um, of the, the research group, uh, but not never really at a summary meeting at, at, as far as I uh, understand. So I'm going to use uh, slides that Klaus has used at an interim meeting and try to give a very quick overview. Uh, there is an internet draft that you can read. It's not very long. Um, so if you want to know more, uh, you can, can acquaint yourself quickly uh, with that. So what's the core of Coral? It's really about links and forms. Um, so um, the, the links we already had in the link format, uh, obviously. Forms really is uh, an idea that uh, where we have links that point to uh, resources that actually require some input to do their job, uh, we also need to describe how this input, input needs to look like. And uh, we're calling it form because that's how uh, the equivalent structure is called in HTML. In HTML, we have a form, which is um, uh, an element that has a link pointing to some resource, plus a description what the input data to that resource would be, usually with a post um, operation. Um, that description, of course, is meant for humans to, to uh, be understood. So the form has uh, presentation aspects to it uh, as well in HTML. We don't have that here. We just describe what, what are the data and what are the semantic um, uh, components of that. So that's the main thing that, that Coral is uh, trying to do. But there is also another aspect. Uh, Coral really is a way to do composition. So you can pull things together into a single instance. And uh, it, it turns out when you actually want to use uh, hypermedia, um, you, you often have the situation that you have really small things. So you have one two byte integer and you, you don't really want to, to um, give uh, somebody else uh, a 20 byte URI to, to get this two byte integer, but really, you really just want to provide this integer. So something that, that has been um, hacked into HTML using the data URIs, of course, we could be using data URIs for, for all these data, but this again would be uh, very inefficient. And really the, the, the whole idea about Coral is to make it simple and obvious and efficient to put things together into a single instance. And one very important 
aspect of this is, of course, it, it shouldn't cause pain, it shouldn't cause cognitive dissonance. Um, and um, the, the most representation formats have to do something complicated with data before you uh, actually can, can include uh, them uh, in there. And Coral, you can just dump them in there and, and use them as they are. So we, we can um, put representations of um, objects into a Coral representation and the, the size of the whole uh, representation is reasonable. Uh, links and forms are also in, um, encoded in a compact uh, format. We use a lot of numbers instead of strings. We use sensible default values. So usually you come up with, with pretty concise results. And I'm not talking about compression here. Compression is always an issue for small devices because it uh, requires lots of resources. It's, it's a concise format from the outset. So when you um, put something down, it's already uh, pretty compact. Yeah, I talked about the, the, uh, the idea to embed a representation uh, into a, a Coral uh, document. And uh, some of the, the gyrations you need to go through when um, processing uh, a traditional JSON style uh, uh, web do document um, are already taken care of. So you in, in Coral, you get ready to munch data. They're, they're cooked. They, you don't have to take them apart and pass and, and uh, take out the bones from the fish and so on. Um, so that, that's the basic idea. Um, concise. Um, you can include what you want to include and it's, it's simple to, to implement. So what's in there? Um, data, of course, some, some form of support for interaction uh, models. Um, and we actually have two formats. Uh, one is the, the interchange format, which is a compact binary format, but it's really hard to write it on a whiteboard because, uh, well, it's binary. Um, and uh, therefore, it probably makes sense to have a textual format. There's still some discussion between the, the users of Coral about how, how well we actually have hit that uh, mark. So maybe the textual format is a bit more, more of an experimental part of Coral, but that's okay because it's not the thing we actually uh, interchange. We interchange the um, binary format. Um, so one other way, of course, would be to say, well, the binary format is in SIBO, so why don't we just uh, use SIBO diagnostic notation? Well, as I said, we are using numbers to, to represent a lot of the structure, and uh, it, that gets pretty tedious uh, writing down uh, quickly. So people are used, for instance, to the way we are um, writing uh, URIs with uh, double slashes somewhere and, and so on. And um, yeah, it, it's nicer to be able to, to use uh, the usual textual conventions. But there is also a danger with having a, a separate textual format. Actually, there are three dangers. Uh, one is that you start thinking about the format as if it were the textual format. And in particular, if you make the textual format convenient uh, for writing things down, um, when, when generating stuff, you might be starting to think in terms of how do I make this look good in the texture format or something like that. But that's not the point. Um, you, you really want the data to be useful and, and to be processable easily. Um, there's also a certain danger that, that these niceties you come up with uh, for, for describing the texture format um, require some, some syntactic processing on the way from the um, texture format to the binary format that you don't actually have in the binary format. So in the binary format, you have committed to something that in the textual format is, is still lazy bound. So th that also can confuse your thinking um, a little bit. And more generally, um, textual formats are, are great for handmade examples, but handmade examples are, are a big problem. And we discussed this at length in, in the Wishy. Uh, 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 phone calls, and um, it, it's really hard. Um, I mean, on, on one hand, you need examples. There, there's no way to design something uh, without good examples. 
But handmade examples of, of data that actually are meant to be generated by machines often don't have the, the, the actual properties of, of what you would get out of a machine. So there, there may be some structure the human has in mind that, that the human actually transfers uh, into the handmade example that would not be present in a binary machine generated example. So the, the, the processor that, that processes the handmade example is happy because it finds the structure, it expects, uh, but it's not there in the, the, the actual binary example. And I'm sure the, the, the JSON LD people are going to run into the same problem uh, as well. Anyway, um, we know about these dangers and, and the hope is that given that we, we keep them in mind, uh, the texture format can still be useful. Um, but it, it's not the thing that, that's actually uh, being interchanged. That's important to keep in mind. Okay, so the, the examples on the next couple of slides are going to be in that textual format. And uh, just to give an example that you know from HTML5, in HTML5 we can describe uh, links with a link element, uh, which has uh, two important attributes, rel and, and href. And um, this describes a link that goes out from the current document, from where you are, uh, describes the link re uh, relation and describes uh, a URL, reference actually, uh, that points to, to some other thing. So in an HTML document, you might find uh, a pointer to a style sheet, a pointer to an a uh, icon, and a pointer to a license that applies to um, this document. And, and writing down the same thing in Coral looks like this in the textual format. Because it uh, becomes very, very uh, compact then in, in the binary uh, form. The actual um, URIs in Coral are IRIs, uh, so we, we fully embrace UTF-8 here. Um, they are uh, in the binary format, actually uh, CIRIs or, or series for short, not to uh, confuse with the um, Apple product of this name. Um, so a Siri is just uh, uh, um, an IRI that doesn't have all this uh, decoration on it. It's pre-passed. It comes to you in a place where you, uh, in a form where you immediately can use it. But you don't uh, see that in the texture format. So if we want to uh, describe uh, Robbie the robot, um, that might have uh, an ID, a name, uh, and some links to other uh, places or other resources. And uh, the nice thing, for instance, is uh, the, the name can actually be written in here, which in link format we wouldn't really be able to do. Uh, we would have to point to another resource that, that uh, carries uh, the name. So the link targets can be literals or they, they can uh, be uh, real uh, links uh, again. And what you also can see here is that uh, we are able to supply a resource. So we know about Nikki, that, that Nikki actually likes Chris. So we can include this information here and we, we can save the receiver of this information from the need to actually follow that link and uh, obtain uh, the data. So we can have um, instances that, that actually contain all the necessary um, data or all the data that will be likely to be used. You can see that, that for Susie, this information is not provided here. Um, so um, yeah, let, let's let's get uh, more more devicey here. Um, so Susie, for instance, has uh, two power LEDs and a status LED and a headlight. Um, so we have the links for the the power. Uh, and status LEDs, we have the link for the headlight. And uh, there is also a form relation here, uh, which tells us to actually change the headlight. Uh, you can do a put, and uh, the, the put accepts a certain media type, which in, in this case is example slash uh, boolean. Do you want to ask a question now? Or? Yes. What happened to the... Yeah, we, we found the... the, the, the Microphone stands, you seem to have a nine to five working time. After five o'clock, they fall down. It's a, it's a microphone stand union gig. It's a, it's a union. Union. Union, yes. It's a union. 
Zach Shobi, um, um, so this is interesting. Why, when I was looking through Coral and I stumbled across this text format thing too. I'm just going like, oh God, another, yet another text format. Like, why can't we just use HTML5 links? Um, and I know what your answer is going to be. And it's going to be that, well, we added this great forms thing and you can't do that in HTML5 links. I actually don't know if that's the right answer. You might be able to do that. So why can't we use something that is an actual text link format that you could then convert from to Coral? Because I would think that for, for the, the bigger web world, right, it would make a lot of sense to have a Coral-like thing, which is in JSON, yes. for example, and then a binary thing, which is Coral, right, rather than having them in two separate worlds. So what, what was the thinking behind that when Klaus was working on this and you guys started it? Um, one of the, the submissions to the IOTC workshop that, that uh, already was mentioned um, uh, before um, had the title uh, uh, Semantic Noise Hurts. And um, since the, the textual language is really only for talking about examples, it makes sense to try to optimize it for this purpose. Um, so all, all the various JSON-based formats are earlier in the 90s, the XML-based formats for talking about XML had this problem that you, you couldn't really use them. So you always needed a tool to actually work with them, mm. which was great for the tool vendors. Um, but uh, uh, then at some point uh, when the, the language RelaxNG uh, was defined, uh, the developer of that uh, burst a pipe and decided, I'm not only going to define an XML syntax, I'm actually going to, to define a compact syntax, the RNC um, uh, syntax, Flex NG con compact. And um, that's a model that, that uh, we often have in mind. And that's the model that, that guided this texture language. But you still didn't understand, answer my actual question, which is, why couldn't we use an existing link format to represent what you would represent in Coral and have an actual machine convertible, you know, make it useful rather than inventing a, a format only for text representation? I mean, engineers interpret all kinds of crap. We read code too, right? We, we could. It doesn't have to be that pretty. The link format is, is uh, way too weak to do all the things that Coral does. So uh, we I'm not saying about it. Yeah, I'm not talking about RFC 6690. Um, I mean, it could be something else. I mean, yeah, can't, I, I, can't HTML5 links do this? Well, HTML5, HTML5 has, has a lot of other problems and it's really a presentation language and, and, and not a data language. Uh, but I, I think that that's a really valid research question. Can you come up with something that looks a lot, lot like HTML5 and that solves this problem in, in a way that you still would want to write this on a whiteboard? And the question, can you convert between HTML5 links and Coral and vice versa? So how do you move again from the constrained world of links and representations to the web world? Because when we worked on 6690, that was the whole, that we went to so much effort and energy to align with web linking. Yes. Right? And you remember how hard that was, right? Yes. So, and we wanted to make sure you could move between the worlds, because I don't really see them as separate, right? I mean, the, the, the web world and the IoT world should be converging, right? So maybe we need to go back to that and figure out what's the comfort level, how much has to be converted back and forth. And was it even worthwhile, the, the work we did to align? Did it matter back then? Uh, Matthias, so just to add to this, so I had big hopes that for the thing description, for the links part, I could, for instance, use the link format JSON in there that it's compatible, that just like the JSON schema, I can use existing other implementations and kind of all fits nicely together. Um, I now hear that it will be kind of our own format. I mean, I guess for the timelines, we need something like this anyway um, to be separate. 
but then there will be some JSON format that describes yes. linking and uh, models basically uh, web linking RFC in linked data. And we also have these forms in there. So somehow there is something popping up that will exist anyway that is a JSON representation um, to have like this, this compatibility that Zach mentions that there are converters then between those would, would be really nice. Yeah, I agree. So again, the, the reason why we didn't finish links JSON was that people thought it might be useful. Okay, we have from uh, Mitico. Yes. Uh, um, hello. I, go ahead, Christian. Um, there, um, one possibility where this could go forward is also to have. Um, uh, Christian, your audio quality is pretty bad. Do you have a way to switch off your camera? Um, I don't know whether that makes it better. Um, yes, it does. Um, one thing that um, that is kind of in what, a proposal in the queue is to make sure that all that can be expressed in Coral can also be expressed in RDF. So you, you could round trip to anything that can encapsulate RDF. So for example, that would be um, HTML. Uh, uh, what was it called? HD, um, RDFA in HTML5. Uh, or turtle for possible um, different representation of the text. So Matthias is going to the microphone. Yeah. Yes, just a quick comment. So um, yeah, that's nice over there. With the thing description, we try to kind of combine this linked data representation with the raw JSON or kind of this intuitive the developers want that JSON representation and yeah it's it's really hard to close this the, the full circle so that's that's one big takeaway from the work in on web of things yeah you can always convert coral into RDF and then that into JSON LD 1.1 and then you have what you want yeah the thing is um JSON LD underlies a lot of restrictions that it's correct triples, and often that's not exactly what the developer that would have written some JSON document would have done. So that's one of the issues that we ran into. Yep. Yeah, the, the, the weird thing about JSON LD is that, that it is really an attempt to, to smuggle RDF into the, the minds of, of uh, JSON minded. Uh, people and and th there is a conflict there and and you are experiencing this conflict uh, every day um, so uh, of course anything that goes through RDF is likely to have the same problem yeah I think there are two camps so one um, maybe expect JSONLT to be a full representation of of triple so to be some full fledged solution like like turtle or RDFA. Um, I'm not sure about that. What I expect from it, that that's a way that I can attach meaning to an existing JSON format that I can convert this to something that then can go into the, the semantic pipeline or the machine learning or whatsoever. So essentially you, you have your own JSON-based language, which just happens to also be a JSON-LD document uh, that, that can be converted into RDF. Yeah, so, so have impedance uh, compatibilities that it's really directly feedable into a JSON-LD 1.1 processor. And then you heard me earlier that one key feature is still missing. So there is still some adaption. So we have to see how this works out. And uh, this alignment is a big challenge because it's many different groups that use it for different purposes. And there's a lot of potential to have a nice solution, but it's also very hard. Okay, I think that, that was a, a useful uh, short dis discussion here. Um, I'm not sure whether I need to go into these uh, descriptions here uh, much more. Um, so here, here's another form relation uh, example. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to, to skip this. Um, again, please do read uh, the internet draft because uh, that's very concise and, and it contains the information uh, that you want to use. So thank you for, for the discussion. Um, again, if, if the, the core work group decides to pick up Coral, 
really the normative part will be the binary uh, format. And uh, it will also be, be of interest to the core working group to understand how existing applications like uh, resource directory and PubSub uh, fit into a world where the coral format is available as one of the media types you can use um, in these applications. So this is probably what the core working group is going to uh, work on. And uh, what, what the research group probably should uh, work on is look at the wider uh, use of uh, coral. How can we use it for uh, new applications and also do these translations, for instance, uh, and try to understand how it works with um, equivalent functionality that is already in W3C, WOT. Um, so I think we have a pretty reasonably defined uh, division of work. Uh, the, the only thing that, that maybe is a little bit uh, difficult, um, the, the one part of Coral that is not yet fully defined is the form relations part. And uh, maybe the, the core working group will first define something um, that, that would have a very simple form of that or may not have it at all. And then it would be the, the job of the research group to maybe look at uh, further uh, development of the form relation idea. Good. So, next item. Do you want to do that? Yes. <laughs> Okay. okay, so we have still nine, nine minutes left. So um, on Friday, we're going to have a ThinkLink RT work meeting. It's now currently scheduled for 8.30 at uh, one twenty in room bottom ground four. Uh, the idea is to start with plenaries in the, in the morning and then continue with breakouts uh, from 10 to 12. Here's the full uh, agenda uh, for this meeting, so you are all very welcome to join. And we will have next a uh, couple of quick lightning talks from the presenters from, from that session to give you a bit of a hint what is there going to be in, in the plenary. So, so do we have uh, Jung Ahong, Eric Nurmag, Tools and Dam here? Excellent. So in order to save time, let's go directly here. So. You want to go first, give your quick pitch on the problem statement of IoT integrated with edge computing. So we have basically edge computing and security are the two key topics there. Okay, the title of this draft is the problem statement of IoT integrated with edge computing. And this document is describing the new challenges for IoT services oriented from the changes in the IoT environment. So to address these new uh, challenges, the edge computing is an emerging technology in IoT. So uh, I'll show two short demo videos uh, as a use case of what we have developed in our department. So one is the smart constructor Constructions utilize EdgeX, which is the uh, found Linux Foundry open source. And the other is the real-time control system by rotary inverted pendulum system. So, yeah, that's it. So I see, oops. So as we all know, um, computing is rapidly heading towards the edge, um, as you can see in the picture. Uh, so that looks very interesting. Um, so in, we've talked in this research group and elsewhere about edge computing to some extent. And what I wanted to do here is sort of turn things around. And even though this is a networking and internet crowd, sort of look at it from the application perspective. What do current applications actually use when they think about a network, right? If they're running as a VM or a container in the cloud, what does that mean if you want to go bring those things to the edge? Or if you want to think about, okay, in the future, are we going to deploy microservices at the edge? Well, what do those applications look like? And what do they assume about what a network is? Um, so uh, some of this stuff I think is sort of more engineering, but, but I think that there's some things we can talk about that sort of touch upon research in this space as well. So that's, 
uh, what I want to cover, and I hope that people will show up on Friday and we can have a lively discussion. Um, so, in, in a nutshell, security is hard, so let's automate it and get it out of the way. Um, what we try with this draft um, is actually that we want to introduce two protocols um, to provision IoT devices securely and then manage them over their lifetime um, securely, basically making sure that whatever vulnerabilities exist and they're going to exist, um, that operator and manufacturers and, and end users have a way of handling them and protecting themselves from any shenanigans that might actually evolve out of having you know something smart in your living room or in your in your company. Thank you. So I would have put it differently. If your security is not automated, you are not secure. But I think we agree on on the basic principle there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It, it's a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. Okay, so these um, these are three of the uh, four um, talks that we will have at the start. And uh, the fourth talk um, doesn't have a pep talk uh, right now because the SEC dispatch uh, meeting was put uh, on top of this meeting. So there are no security people in this room. Hello, Hannes. Uh, <laughs> Okay, oh, Jim is also there. Francesca is there. Um, okay, not quite true. Uh, anyway, so we want to have the, these talks to, to prime our minds. And then at 9.40, we want to discuss what, what are uh, good breakouts to have. Uh, so we are not going to sit in plenary. We're going to, to uh, divide ourselves in two or three uh, breakouts and um, do these from 10 to 12. And then at the end, sit together and, and uh, pull together the information that we have learned. And um, one of the, the breakouts, uh, and I think did we have that slide now, we forgot to put in that slide. Um, one of the uh, breakouts is uh, going to be the, the, pardon? the coin uh, site meeting, computing um, in the uh, internet. So that, that is certainly also relevant to the edge computing issue. So I think the, the people who are interested in edge computing will uh, probably decide whether to run their own breakout on IoT Edge or, or go to that um, site meeting. And uh, two other uh, uh, breakouts um, that, that might happen are about security because we have uh, several uh, uh, talks about security as, as input and there's a lot to do there and um, also about hypermedia, where um, I think most of the work on, on hypermedia that we will do in, in the next uh, few months um, is uh, not going to happen in, in the meeting room, uh, but it's going to happen in interops. So the, the, the next step really uh, will be to plan uh, how we can pull off uh, something that, that um, works a lot like the W3C plug tests um, or what we do in Wishy and look specifically at the hypermedia uh, support and things like Coral uh, core apps and, and maybe some some more JSON oriented uh, features as well. So that, that might be a third uh, break or just planning that and, and finding out um, how we will um, do this. So I think by January we're going to have a a uh, bigger um, uh, interrupt event, possibly even a physical one, but with uh, remote dial-in uh, capability. I think we are pretty much at the end of our time slot. So any final words that people want to have? Wonderful, so you get one minute of your life back and uh, uh, see you in Prague. I'll see you on Friday. And if you haven't signed the blue seats yet, please do so. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs>
Well, uh, yeah, we might put it.